Hello, <laughs> it's me, your favorite pastry based life form. Did I put on stream close caption? This is the true question. Well, as always, I need to uh, uh, fix the it alerts me because it's an. It's they're not good <laughs> by accident. <laughs> so it just it meets a northern accent and it's it runs away. Um as I was saying before stream co close co co ho 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 such a great start to a reading stream and I can't <laughs> I can't even read chat. Before stream post captioner so rudely interrupted me. Hello, it's me, your favourite pastry based life form. Uh, you know, so far I'm doing great at this year's uh this year's goal of streaming at least once a month. <laughs> What we are like nearly halfway through February, <laughs> but um, trying to think of what I was going to say, and it's all fallen off my mind. Um, I've been thinking about um, maybe doing a stream next week where I pick a random writing prompt out of. Uh, a hat and try and write something for it in a stream. I think that would be cool. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, can you tell that I'm rusty again? <laughs> uh, my voice is also going, which is a great sign for the beginning of our conversation. <laughs> Getting my piece of paper to write notes on because last stream we found a lot of problems. <laughs> uh, I have you just I have edited this the book, but sometimes you just you look at it so much that it drives you insane and you can't see spelling problems. <laughs> Are just whole sentences that make no sense whatsoever. I'm uh, just finding it <laughs> as we speak. Because I wanted to read the synopsis. <laughs> As always, there's a content warning. It changes every time. It usually, uh, the big ones, the mental and physical health problems, the ableism, people in power just being dicks. And uh, in this section of the book, uh, it's probably <laughs> add. Uh, blood battles um, and violence, but I think that's all covered under battles, really. Um, because at the moment, if I remember correctly, where we are, which <laughs> I'm pretty sure we've read chapter 40, so we're starting at 41. And in chapter 39 and 40, the main character's Dax, a guy who transmigrated into the heavenly realm <laughs> via spilling beef noodles on a keyboard and electrocuting himself because how could he have done anything else? Um, and the god of war whose name I misspelled 
for seven chapters <laughs> without realizing uh Elgaldia had a little a little conversation about the past and how Dax's body's person uh he's currently in the body of Dethos, the god of wheat and wheat byproducts <laughs> um died by uh being killed by Elgaldia in a battle. Um, can you tell him what link? <laughs> For anyone who hasn't been here before or read the story, I am going to post the streams on YouTube at some point. I just edited the last one, it took forever. <laughs> and for anyone who was there during that, look back on it and be like I can't tell that you did anything at all <laughs> and I don't know whether that would be a compliment or an insult <laughs> so uh, here's the synopsis of the whole the whole book Dax Moonfield just wanted to pass his university entrance exam they had other ideas after an interesting accident involving a pot of instant noodles and a computer keyboard, he found himself in the heavenly realm. Life as the beloved god of wheat isn't simple. Overprotective deities, a body that's damaged and a severe lack of believers are just some of the hurdles. And truly they are just some. <laughs> I am going to post the link if anyone is interested in reading the text version of it. Uh, it's available on the hellscape that is Wattpad. <laughs> um, I don't know where else to post original fiction in the world that we live in right now. So it's, it's on Wattpad. <laughs> Uh, I think I have up to 43 available at the moment, and then 44 won't be posted till midnight. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Midnight, Monday, British time, whatever time zone we're in right now. <laughs> I think we're still in. Are we in? In June tea still? I think so. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so we should probably we we'll probably start. <laughs> I was thinking maybe to do thirty nine and forty again. For anyone who. It would be very weird to join and start the at 41, really. But for the sake of me editing later, <laughs> we're going to do from 41 to 44 tonight. So I transmigrated to the heavenly realm by reflections on the pole also known as me, uh, Shiny Hedge Pig. Chapter 41, the morning after. The morning after finding out everything <laughs> that he <I> did yesterday. <laughs> I didn't know what he had done till much later, Elgaldia said, the hem of his shirt sleeve, which he had been rolling nervously between his fingers for several minutes now, was beginning to fray from the stress. I don't feel like I can expect you to forgive me. Dax didn't know how to feel about any of it. He'd re-emerged from the memory with a killer headache and so many questions he wanted to ask. What became of the Demon Realm's Emperor? he asked. He'd already re-traumatised both of them. 
might as well go for the whole hog tonight <laughs> whilst he was at it. A shiver ran through him, more from the weight of the memories than from the actual physical cold. He shuffled closer to the warmth radiating from the other god. I killed him too, Elgaldia said, sighing. Things got very bad after you that were injured. They had to get the heavenly emperor to restrain me personally. They kept me in chains for a few hundred years until the bloodlust subsided. You shouldn't blame yourself, Dethos soothed, looking intensely at Elgaldia. He grabbed both sides of his face with his hands when he refused to meet his gaze for extra empathy. Em em extra empathy. <laughs> extra em emphasis. <laughs> oh, it's gone so well. <laughs> you were possessed by a demonic portion and trying to do what your believers wanted you to do. Sometimes what they want, sometimes what they want hurts, Elgaldia stammered, his face flushing red. I forgot to say, the only person who gets the voice is, this, is the system. Is it an AI and it's easy? <laughs> uh, blah, blah, blah. You were possessed by a demonic portion and trying to do what your believers wanted. Sometimes what they want, sometimes what they want hurts. Algaldia stammered, his face flushing red. Dax went to a place, went to place, a calming hand on his shoulder, but he had suddenly changed his sitting position. Except he wasn't saying. Elgaldia had been kneeling. Kneeling. Kneeling on the polished tiles. The God of War's knees were used to kneeling. Enamel tiles were a luxury. It usually took place in pea gravel. He really, truly. <laughs> there was a point when I was writing this and I was like, how many times can this man kneel in gravel without doing himself serious injury? Also, I just realised we never went to the reading screen. Hello, welcome to the reading screen. Also, maybe I wasn't here because we're not looking at it. So maybe we go back here. <laughs> I do have a reading screen. Look how fancy. <laughs> Look how fancy it was. Ah, uh, I'm also thinking about redoing all of my scenes again and redrawing myself even though this one is cute it's too small so when i need it to be bigger uh it does not like it <laughs> unless you want to see every pixel <laughs> uh truly be looking like an 8-bit graphic <laughs> sometimes uh back to the story we went talking about kneeling in pea gravel. Yes, yes. <laughs> His subordinates in the war department had viewed it as a ceremonial or had viewed it as ceremonial or signs of some mental illness, but he'd done it for years in search of forgiveness, some sense of absolution. I've thought about that night endlessly over the many years that have passed. I should have protected you, Elgaldia said from his new kneeling position. I should have protected your people. I should have protected your temple. He was truly sobbing now, not for the last time. Dax cursed. Dax cursed their size differences as he attempted to pull Elgaldia to his feet. It was like trying to move a mountain, a very reluctant mountain, with a spoon. He sighed, reaching down with his hands and brushing away the other god's tears with his fingers. The handkerchief he had used before, now too wet to be of any use. Dax sat down again when it became clear Elgaldia wasn't going to be moving anywhere for a while. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> he put his own hands into the fretting hands of the god of war as he tried to word what he wanted to say. Instinctively, he had wanted to go in for a hug, but right now he wasn't sure if Elgaldia would welcome that. I'd give anything to be able to go back there again, Elgaldia sobbed. He would do anything he could, if given even the smallest of chances to do so. Dax could see it in his eyes. You don't have to apologise. The past is over and done with. We were different people then. 
no use crying over spilt milk, water under the bridge and all that, Dax thought. He might not be the actual Dethos could have wait, but the Dethos in the recovered memories didn't give him the idea that he would be resentful. I don't resent you. People die in wars. If there was anyone Dax was angry with, it was with the days he's interacted with so far, who had acted like De Dethos had died at the hands of a serial killer and not in an understandable workplace accident. Each of them shed tears which fell onto their joined hands. It was just a generally fucked up situation all around. Dax smiled in what he hoped was a comforting manner. He wasn't exactly adept at comf comforting the people. The <laughs> Switch my phone off before it distracts me anymore. Or Dean. We'll start that sentence from, just from the top. <laughs> if there was anyone Dax was angry with, it was with the deities he's interacted with so far, who had acted like Dethos had died at the hands of a serial killer and not in an, in an understandable workplace accident. Each of them shed tears which fell onto their joined hands. It was just a generally fucked up situation all around. Dax smiled in what he hoped was a comforting manner. He wasn't exactly adept at comforting the person who killed the person whose body he was possessing. Surprisingly, people didn't write etiquette books for this sort of situation. Feeling emboldened by System's willingness to silently hover next to him, Dax offered Elgaldia a hug. The taller god took him up on the offer, burying his head in the smaller god's shoulder. Dax got up to also kneel, though he winced as he did so. Knees were not made for enameled, decorative, floral things. The hug was brief and very awkward, but he felt a lot better afterwards, and he hoped Elgaldia did also. When they had started talking, the sky had been blue and filled with fluffy white clouds. Now it was clear and sprinkled with stars. They both rose stiffly to their feet. I missed you a lot, Elgaldia said, now wiping his eyes with his own handkerchief retrieved from some inner pocket. I had gathered that, Dax said somewhat dryly, though he was a he wore a teasing smirk on his face. You did send me over a million prayers. Dax and Elgaldia were still standing in the garden when the first spidery fingers of sunlight started climbing over the walls of the little garden. Birds were singing somewhere far off in the distance, and the moths that had been there were now replaced with vividly red butterflies. One landed on a yellow rose right next to Dethos's ear. Its wings tickled him, as if it searched for nectar. Dax smiled. Elgaldia smiled back at him. Yesterday's conversation had taken hours, so long that the sun had been replaced by the moon. After they had both finished talking, Dax and Elgaldia had sat together all night. Elgaldia had shown him to an actual bench once he'd noticed his, his discomfort gained from spending hours sitting on the floor. Dax shook his foot back and forth, trying to regain the feeling in it again, as pins and needles shot up and down it. The hours till sunrise were spent mostly in a silence that was oddly comfortable. What wasn't silence was the two of them chatting about rather mundane things pertaining to palace cleaning and complaints about the ineff inefficiencies of paperwork. The silences didn't feel as caverning and foreboding as they had before. Dax no longer felt compelled to rush to fill them in either. Silence also gave him the time and space to really think about the memories that were now available. He really didn't understand everyone's take on Elgaldia killing him, now that he knew what had actually happened. Dax certainly didn't hold it against him, and he was 95% sure that Dethos wouldn't either. The god had just been promoted on the battlefield, with no time to adjust to his powers. Dax had been here for weeks, and he still couldn't use Dethos' powers reliably. Then he'd been poisoned by a mind-altering substance whilst trying his best to defend everyone from the literal poster boy of evil, hundreds of years chained up and thousands spent personally beating himself up about something that at worst was a mistake. That sh uh, something that at its worst was a mistake and should 
that should be more than enough for anyone. <laughs> there we go for a strangled sentence that we have, that we have in this. Neither of them were in any rush to return to the lives that they had outside of this private garden. Pink skies turned blue as they sat together side by side on the small bench. Somewhere outside, there was probably a mob of irate people wanting to know where they'd been all day. Dax momentarily felt bad that he had kept El Galdi from his work for so long, but looking at him smiling now squashed that feeling down. He could have said something if he'd wanted to leave. Could have pushed it to another time, another day, told him to fuck off. It almost felt like the rest of the world didn't exist here, just a room filled with roses, moths, butterflies, birds and whispering grasses, the changing colours of the sky the only clue to the progression of time. System was leaving him alone still, some reassurance that he was still acting reasonably in character and that maybe he was doing the right thing. But that wouldn't last forever. When the sky was finally blue, the sunlight's warmth reached the little garden. The birdsong was interrupted as the door leading to the rest of the world was kicked wide open. It bounced off the wall, shaking on its hinges as it swung back. They're content. They're content. Yes, they're, they're YouTube content. <laughs> they're content little bubble burst. Standing on the other side of the door was an extremely pissed off Ulris, holding an unsheathed sword in their right hand. Both Elgaldia and Dax had jumped when the door had almost been knocked off its hinges. Dax had actually nearly tipped backwards all over the bench into a ro rose bush, but Elgaldia managed to grab hold of his waist before he was skewered by thorns. Ulris seemed to find this action to be particularly objectionable. Their expression contorted from pissed off to absolute rage. They stormed into the garden, still pointing their sword at Elgaldia as he gingerly removed his supporting arm from Dax's waist, only after ensuring he wasn't going to fall again. The gaggle of guards Dax recognised as being faces he'd seen around his own palace followed after. He smiled and waved at Adelum, who was often the front door guard that brought him his daily food, and he sheepishly waved back. Dax was happy to see the basket of food he'd brought with him because he was starving right now. At least someone remembered to feed him. Aside from Adelum, everyone else's faces were contorted with just about the same amount of rage as Ulris. Dax watched them all walk closer as if they were approaching a rabid dog and could feel what understanding he had had he had 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 had, had, had. <laughs> what understanding he had had for their worry quickly evaporate without so much as a word to him Ulrich reached out and grabbed his arm before he could do anything to defend himself from their grip they tried to pull him away from Elgaldia by force and that was when Dax finally lost his shit <laughs> someone who had transmigrated here and, and inherited the body of a god that was gravely wounded, if not permanently disabled. He knew that others were concerned about Dethos. He had to eat food because he got hungry, something they only did when they really badly hurt or low on power. They often found him sleeping on random surfaces. His legs were still weak, and what did they expect? Chaining someone to a stone underneath a lake for thousands of years wasn't exactly conductive to maintaining muscle tone. He was still feeling the after effects of that. Dethos's body didn't heal easily. The angry scar tissue from his battle wounds and scuffs gained from hiding in that rose bush earlier <laughs> were testament to that. Every day he had to strip off all his clothes and all but bathe in scar cream so that he wouldn't lose flexibility as the wounds slowly healed. So what if he had to sit down when his legs protested at standing for too long? Back home, he would have gotten some sort of walking aid and physiotherapy. Hell, in the early days of being here, he should have been given a wheelchair and some home help. That hadn't happened, though. Ableism. It's just like, hey, you got problems, but we're not going to do anything about that. But we are going to have a go at you. Trying to do something about that.
gods, am I right? <laughs> Dax had found himself surrounded by people that followed him, who did nothing for him that was actually helpful. Dax didn't know whether the wounds were supposed to still be hurting as much as they did. Was he supposed to do anything special about taking care of them? He'd been wearing the simplest of Dethos' robes because he couldn't reach round behind himself to do up the buttons of the fancier ones on his own. People were desperate to baby him, and yet didn't seem particularly interested in actually providing him with the support he actually needed to get better and do his job. The way everyone seemed to think that they were going to be able to keep secrets from him forever was practically hilarious in its condense condensation. <laughs> Condescension. <laughs> That's truly a new one. <laughs> Dethos to them had amnesia. But neither Dethos nor Dax were stupid. With the story as famous as dying in the battle that ended an inter-realm war that had spanned hundreds of years at the hands of the god of war whilst trying to defend his own temple full of believers, he would have found out. He would have found out or been able to put things together on his own or someone would have told him that wasn't part of this whole conspiracy. They were dumb. They were very dumb and he was sick of this whole charade. Dax was sick of being treated like a child who was incapable of making decisions for themselves. Taking away someone's autonomy wasn't something that should have been... Taking away someone's autonomy wasn't something that should be seen as a simple, easy thing to do. Eating bread, sleeping on the floor and regaining what seemed like an important friendship were important to him, even if everyone else thought it was a crazy path to take. Even if it was a crazy path, it was a path that was his right to take, should he so wish to. And he did wish. As his anger rose up from somewhere deep within him, Dax could also feel his power rising too. It surged in exactly the same way it had in his in the, 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 in the memories he and Ilgaldi had shared last night. Not as strongly, but tangibly bigger than they had been during his public panic attack in the War Department's lobby. It was almost scary. I wonder if they will ever be able to get rid of the wheat, he pondered to himself, as he felt it rush through him. His fingers were growing moss again. Gold sparks started emitting from his skin, like he had become some sort of divine walking fireworks to spur. A godly sparkler. He would have laughed if it wasn't for how uncomfortable he was right now. Starting the magic was a lot easier than ending it, and Dax wasn't very confident that he was going to be able to do that on his own. Ulris immediately let go of his arm the moment that the sparks hit their unprotected palms. They had to back away from him quickly as the raw magic grew, increasingly intense. As quickly and fiercely as this show of power by Dax had come through, it drained away from him at a similar speed. All the energy that he had gained from all of those points he had gained all the energy he had gained from all the points he had gained yesterday vanished without a trace. All those prayers answered had only give, been able to give him so much power. His well was dry. There was nothing left to draw upon to protect himself. Elgaldia stood from the place that he had maintained, sitting at his side and placed an arm around his back and under his armpit to keep him from keeling over. He said something too, but Dax was already fully unconscious again. It felt like it had to be the ten thousandth time after waking up in this strange world. He was really going to have to have words with System when he woke up, or maybe the other. <laughs> he has spent a considerable amount of time unconscious in the story so far. Mini Theo. Dax? Question mark. Author? Question mark. Dax? Question mark. Author? Shrugs. I'm innocent in this. Dax? Glias. Author? Shrugs again. Why are we even doing this? Dax continues glaring. Arthur, stop using all your energy and magic up at once and you'll stop collapsing. Have you never played Supernova Condensation Canyon? Dax, you made me a hardcore MMORPG player. Arthur, 
then why do you keep insisting on spamming all your abilities and complaining, complaining, complaining about time gated cooldowns? That's that's what we do. That's what we do. That's what we live for. End of chapter forty one. <laughs> I'm just trying to just... And then chapter 42 after I have the drink. Chapter 42. What did you do to my patient? Omdum left the sunlight filled room in which they had laid out an unconscious Dethos on a small but comfortable hospital bed. As he left, he gently pulled the dark clothes behind him so as not to wake the weak god, waiting for him outside when were a not insignificant number of guards awkwardly trying not to block the narrow corridor for the healers rushing back and forth along it. This was one of the busiest parts of the entire healing halls. The way that they were pressed the way that they pressed themselves against the wall would be amusing if Omdum wasn't outraged by their behaviour at this moment in time. He would have... Let's see if we can find... Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I was talking about... He would have to find the amusement in it later. Right now, he had a lot of things that needed to be said. I am not... I'm not going to tell you how to do your job. Uh, sorry, I accidentally tapped out. Uh, I was saying uh, that if anyone tells you that they're not telling you how to do your job, but then goes, but <laughs> they're telling you how to do your job. I'm not telling you how to do your job, but you seriously need to stop. Stressing him out, the God of Healing said, holding the charts of one of Dethos, God of Wheat, in his hands. For being a god that had been so badly injured, it was already a miracle that he wasn't dead, even more so when his believer base had dwindled, dwindled to practically nothing. Healing the trauma from the battle mentally and physically was going to take a long time, much longer than a deity in their prime would take. And that was all the more reason that he was pissed off right now. The assembled guards looked chagrined, except for Ulrus, who was glaring at him and clenching their jaw in what Omdum took to be an attempt at being menacing. He'd seen scarier-looking kittens before. He needs someone to look over him, not a jailer, Omdum said in an annoyed tone that matched their facial expression. This literally hasn't happened before, Ulrus said, walking forward to stand in front of the angry healer. They could both feel the curious eyes of the gathered guards upon them. Omdum guessed that was why Ulrus felt so confident in challenging him on his magical opinion. It was true that there had never been anyone else that had been dealt with such a bum hand of cards. That made certain things very difficult. His wounds had healed physically, though Dethos was still covered in heavy scarring, scars that were a constant reminder of what had happened. Omdum really had tried everything that he knew of to reduce their prominent gold sheen, the fine ridges they gave Dethos's skin and any residual pain or restriction of movement that they would give him, but there was always something unpredictable about scars. On one person, they would melt away, even they would forget that there had ever been a scar there at all. Someone else would be left left with visible, painfully disabling ones. Looking at Dethos right now, it was hard to say which way his case was going to go. Caring for Dethos meant having to make treatments up on the fly because there weren't any precedents. Number one rule in Omdun's Department of Healing was to ensure that all patients were given dignity during the time they were under his care. It's precisely because it's never happened before that it's so important to deal with this delicately and not make him have a panic attack because you're not letting him live his life, he scolded. Because his stress levels were through the roof. 
Amadon had given advice that he should rest, but his patient was the one. <laughs> Omdum had given advice that he should rest, but his patient was the one best able to define what that meant to him. Theothos' condition being so novel to them meant that the god of healing was happy to let that happen. The biggest thing you could give a patient was the ability to make what choices they were capable of, <laughs> capable of making about their own care. <sighs> <laughs> Truly struggling to read this, this time. But we're doing our best. Doing our best. Dethos had been unconscious for so long they'd had to make medical choices for him, and when he woke up it had taken time for them to notice. The god of wheat had already proven that he was plenty capable of taking care of himself, though it seemed the reports he had been receiving from Ulrus were not the full story of what was happening, and that was something he needed to sort out right now. Once Dethos woke, the god of healing would ensure to perform a full examination, an interview with him, to see what support he needed now that his wounds were mostly scar tissue. We are doing what's best for him, Ulrus said, their arms crossed over their chest. Omdum sighed so deeply that it felt like he was never going to breathe in again and moved to block the door to Dethos's room even more so than he'd already been doing. Trulvenus's guards were not known for their subtlety and they certainly never knew when to quit. Much like Trulvenus. Well, guess what neither you nor even His Majesty the Emperor. Well, guess what? Neither you, nor even his majesty the emperor, are his parents or guardians, nor is he a child or incapable of understanding how to weigh up benefits and consequences. There's this thing that you learn when you practice medicine, and that's that you can't make a patient make the right decisions, Omdum said, looking out at all the young faces before him. He took several seconds before continuing his speech to let his words sink in under the orders they had already been given. And what, you, and what you are doing right now is severely overstressing a god that has spent nearly 4,000 years trying to heal from what happened. And how he isn't dead is tantamount to a miracle. Omdum kind of also wanted to tell them that following Drill Venus's every wish and command at face value probably wasn't going to be great for their futures, but that was something for them to work out on their own. The guards shifted uncomfortably on their feet. They felt bad, but this was a duty that they had been tasked with by the Heavenly Emperor himself. It wasn't something that they could just suddenly decide not to do. Well, they could, but they would also not have a job either. The, heaven... the Emperor of Heaven had considerable sway over his followers, compared to other deities in the Heavenly Realm. The vast majority of humans believed in him, so going against him was pretty much career suicide. Omdum, who was still staring at all their unchangingly determined faces, let out another frustrated breath. I'm going to see Joe Venus and kick some actual sense into him. Whilst I'm gone, no one is to enter his room other than my staff unless Dethos wakes and asks for someone to enter. Yes, that means Elgaldi can enter if Dethos asks for him. I don't care what any of you have to say about that. Ulrus was the only member of the guards that managed to keep a straight face at the God of Healing's statement, the others visibly shocked at what he had said. There weren't many people who could call the Heavenly Emperor by his name, and never mind threaten to assault him in public. <laughs> no one had ever threatened to kick the Emperor of Heaven in front of them, other than the Empress or his consort, but who did that? No one had ever threatened to kick the Emperor of Heaven in front of them, other than the Empress or his consort, who did that on a pretty much day-to-day -day basis. Omdum, though, was technically Drill Venus's senior in the Heavenly Realm, though hardly anyone seemed to remember that. He had been part of a many thousands of years earlier in a flux of deities. There were many benefits to being an old deity, and though whilst he was nowhere near as old as Mother Willow, let's be frank, no one still roaming the earth was, he was no spring chicken either. Humans had prayed for someone to heal their wounds and illnesses, even before they were human. Being sick or hurt in some way was the most common form of death. 
Few other humans ever allowed the luxury of dying from old age. Omdum ascended the steps to the heavenly realm, the same day as the goddess of motherhood, Sido. They said, <laughs> Sido. I said Sido. That's a Pokemon. <laughs> That's definitely a Pokemon. They still did a lot of work together. Birth was a difficult and often dangerous time for pregnant people. The god of healing pulled his rank as both their senior and as the presiding physician to banish the lot of them from cluttering the hallway outside of Dethos' room, forcing them to go sit in a waiting room until Dethos was back in the world of the conscious. He'd made sure to set some of his own guards outside it to ensure that the god of wheat could rest undisturbed. At least for a while, Dethos would be able to receive his treatments in peace. Right now, the god of healing had to have some angry words with a certain nosy busybody. Mini theater. Unconscious Dax. Why is it so noisy? System. Various deities are arguing outside of your hospital room. Unconscious Dax. Can you make them shut up? My head feels like people are mining for diamonds in it. System. No, but I can erect a one-way sound barrier for the room. Unconscious Dax. That would be nice. Why have you never told me you could do that before? System. I can only do it in the dream world. Unconscious Dax. Dream world? System. Shush, <laughs> go to sleep. <laughs> the system is so funny, <laughs> so silly. So funny, so silly. I'm recording this several months after what you've just heard. The original uh, chapter 43 was lost to the void due to internet problems, so I'm re-recording it. So if it sounds weird or like it doesn't, <laughs> very obviously not from that time. <laughs> um, I just want you to know that you're not insane. <laughs> you're very much is different as you can see by my different leaf um yeah i'll just i'll just i'll just do it now <laughs> i'll just read it now chapter 43 the striped confrontation omdum was the sort of god that got a fast pass through the palace of uh, 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 uh. i'm not any better at reading but <laughs> omdum was the sort of god that got a fast pass through the palace of the heavenly emperor's security it wasn't a perk that he used often, but when he actually had a reason to be there, he was very grateful to have such privileges. It certainly beat having to kick his front door open. You could usually find Drilvenus either in the throne room, in his council chambers meeting with various important deities, or drinking wine down in one of his many ornamental gardens. Despite asking several of the attendants, Omdum was none the wiser as to where the object of his current annoyance was right now. He walked all the way down through ostentatious corridors covered in gold leaf and crystal light fittings to the council chambers, only to find them empty. Walking back up the many stairs and then traversing his way through yet more of them to get to the throne room really wasn't how he had imagined he was going to spend the day, but he was determined to have his demands met. For the average day, having spent this much time looking for someone would probably have dampened some of the anger that they had left their residence with. He secretly thought this was the entire purpose of the palace's layout in the first place, but when something impacted his patient's ability to recover or trampled their rights, Omdum was not so easily assuaged. In fact, he was becoming increasingly annoyed. Why the hell was this place so big in the first place? 
Good thing ascended deities didn't ever need to use the toilet because you would 1000% piss yourself before you ever found a bathroom. If you were human, would you really want to pray to an emperor that constantly pissed his pants because he couldn't reliably navigate his own house? Probably not. The throne room's heavy wooden door was thrown open for him, but Omdum found all three seats upon the dais empty. Not only were the seats empty, the entire cavernous room was void of life. Where there were normally groups of councillors chatting together, staff running messages back and forth and the occasional guards standing watch over one of the realm's citizens, there were only dust motes swirling through the air. A curtain, normally drawn off the exit to the extensive balcony, was flapping loosely in the wind. It had been pulled back slightly and not returned to its original place. That was what he had that was what had initially drawn Omdum's eye to it. The door that lay beyond had to be open. Julvinus very rarely spent any time on the balcony, and Omdum would never have thought to look for him out there. Neither would any of Drilvinus's palace's staff. The perfect place to hide from your work without getting found. He slipped through the gap in the curtain, its velvet fabric brushing against his face. Drilvinus turned to him, shocked at having had his hiding place found out at last. Omdum wondered just how long he'd been standing out here. Red wine in a crystal glass covered in delicate etchings stood at the balustrade that prevented you from falling several hundred feet down the side of the hill that the palace was built upon into the second level of the city below it. Very handy at parties that included the deities of alcohol who never seemed to be able to only have one glass. They were very messy drunk. Omdum's expression, or maybe just the general aura of his demeanour, seemed to get the purpose of his visit across to the emperor, who quickly picked the glass back up and gestured to the healing god to follow him. Countless stars passed by them along a myriad of snaking corridors before Drilvinus walked into a rather large... or small. It's, it's definitely small. <laughs> a rather small side room. On one side of the room was an impressive fish tank that reached from floor to ceiling and wall to wall. Fronds of seaweed drifted side to side, buffeted by the bubbles from the air pump and the bubbler. Small, brightly coloured fish peeked out from behind the seaweed, their scales shining in the light suspended over the tank. No matter how remarkable the tank was, it could not distract Omdum from the travesty that was the rather ugly carpet that spanned the floor of the entire room. Drilvinus saw him eyeing the carpet in disgust, but he hadn't bothered to veil in politeness. It's in its densely packed, uneven chevrons were, after all, highly distracting. When you walked across it, the carpet gave you a migraine that lasted long after leaving. He strongly believed that if it were ever placed on a staircase, someone would fall to their death because they wouldn't be able to reliably judge where the edge of the stairs was. Even, look at it, even looking at it right now made him feel nauseous. Mother's choice, the emperor stated, casually gesturing to it with a lazy sweep of his free hand, the other still gently holding the delicate crystal wine glass. Ugly, yes, but one doesn't have the heart to rip it up. Can we concentrate on the matter at hand? Omdum asked. He hadn't come for a tour of the palace's more obscure rooms or to discuss their gaudy decor. He decided to look at the fish to distract himself from the flooring. There was a tiger-skin rug on the floor that continued the oddly striped theme of this particular room, and that increased his reliance on not looking downwards in order to have have this conversation. One was merely attempting to make polite small talk, the heavenly emperor said reproachfully, as he brushed invisible dust from the seat of a gaudy mauve velvet chair covered in embroidered peonies before sitting down. He gestured to the god of healing to, to also take a seat beside him, but he remained standing. He was stubborn like that. But he didn't look any more comfortable than standing. Polite small talk wasn't why he had come to speak to him, and the delay was further annoying when he had already spent so much time away from his patients. He wondered whether Dethos had woken up yet and what condition he was in. Hopefully the guards that he had set would be able to would enable the god to actually be able to rest properly for once. I don't have all day, the god of healing said, trying to speed things up a little. Conversely, do you think I am made of spare time, said Drilvinus, who was now some, somehow sipping on a gin and tonic instead of the wine he had brought with him. 
Umdum huffed. Look, the thing you're doing with Dethos is making him ill. He fainted again? Yes, after draining all of his energy completely. This is precisely why he needs watching, Drilvenus insisted, rolling his glass lazily in his hand, causing the chunks of ice floating in it to clink against the glass. It's making things worse. You and I both know that there is something wrong. This has literally never happened before. How are we supposed to know if something is wrong, Omdum said. What was happening to Dethos wasn't so out of the realm of possibility that Omdum would go around saying that it was something wrong. Healing takes time and wounds, and the wounds he had been given were extensive. His powers as a god were almost non-existent. He had no followers among the humans in the mortal realm. It was going to take time for Dethos to be fully back to some semblance of normal. He's not just been eating regularly, but experiencing actual hunger. Ulrus told me that he's sleeping for upwards of six hours a night, Drilvenus said. His eyebrows were raised in a way that said, You should be more concerned about this. In the old times, we all did, Omdum sighed. If someone suddenly started eating out of nowhere, then that would be concerning, but when his god powers were so low, acting more like a mortal wasn't making him more concerned than he already was. Dethos going around as normal whilst this badly hurt and his prayer base so damaged would have been truly more concerning to him as a healer. Because that's how humans envisaged deities back then. No one goes around thinking that we can't fulfil their wishes because it's lunchtime or we're sleeping, said the Emperor, no longer sitting quite so casually in the ugly chair as he had been at the start of their conversation. The padding in its cushions squeaked as he pulled himself more upright. He might very well need watching over but preventing him from seeing the god of war is neither working nor helping. You not being able to see that is also entirely childish. I had hoped to in introduce them formally in a controlled environment when Dethos had regained his memories. Well, said Omdum, sarcasm practically dripping off of every letter. It certainly had neither been formal nor controlled during the crowd crush, she thought, and they had met multiple times before that. Keeping them apart obviously hadn't been as easy as the Emperor had thought it would be. Omdum didn't know, which he was more annoyed by, that he had tried to keep them apart, or that he hadn't tried harder to actually do so. It seemed like Drilvenus had only put in place the minimum amount of effort to achieve this thing he seemed so, to consider so important. There's no need to say that so sarcastically, but I get your point, said the Emperor, before knocking back the rest of his drink. What are you going to do? Omdum asked. This whole conversation was starting to feel like pulling teeth. Getting information out of his, this junior was next to impossible, even. <gasps> it seemed when that information was something vital to you actually being able to carry out your job. Effectively. Well, Dolvina said with the exact same imitation and facial expression. I was thinking of just making a certain war god do it. What does that? Even mean, the god of healing thought. This whole conversation was making him increasingly more irked the longer it continued. Don't think that I don't know your guards were doing the bare minimum and not conveying Dethos's physical state to me. Why, do, why didn't you go see him yourself? Mini theater, Omdum, this decor is really something else. Drilvenus, I'm glad you like it so much. Omdum. It's one thing to be rich, it's another to have no taste. Drilvenus, says the god who lives in a white child box with no furniture. Omdum, it's called minimalism. Some Someone like you wouldn't understand. Drilvenus, you're right, I don't. It looks like someone stole everything you own but a table and an ugly potted plant. Arthur, maybe they did. Maybe. Maybe they did. <laughs> End of chapter 43. Chapter... Or E4. Chapter 44. Medical support. Waking up from being unconscious yet again was disconcerting. He had no idea where he was for several minutes until he recognised that this was the same room he had been in when he had first woken up in the heavenly city's healing halls and not the small courtyard. The God Hospital. 
While not exclusively for gods, it was more amusing to refer to it in this way in his mind. Pushing back the bed covers was just as difficult as it had been the first day he had found himself in the heavenly city. Someone had tucked him in to bed so tightly that it was amazing he could even feel his feet at all. Had Dax still been human, he would surely have suffocated if they were on that tight. He was thankfully still wearing the clothes that he had chosen especially to visit Elgaldia at his office. It might be a healer's job to help people change clothes, but it still made Dax uncomfortable to know that someone had done that whilst he was not aware of, what, of it happening. His right wrist was swollen, patchy gold splodges across the skin there, where the fresh blood was pooling beneath it, and more of a bronze colour where it clotted and his body had started to break it down. When Ulrus had grabbed his arm, Dax hadn't noticed just how tightly their fingers had been curled around his wrist. He brought his arm up closer to his face and saw small crescent indentations from Ulrus's fingernails that were prominent in his flesh. Great, another injury to add to the list of injuries that I already had, Dax thought angrily to himself. It didn't matter that his assigned guard had thought they were helping him. That help was looking a lot more like hurting in the light of the healing room's expansive array of crystal lights. The fanciness of the lighting had always struck him as an odd choice for a hospital room. The heavenly realm really liked being overly gaudy. This wasn't the room that he'd woken up in last time, Dax realised. Though the shape and colour of it was the same, most of the decorations were different, and on one wall there was a painting of a sunset that he supposed was meant to bring about feelings of calmness and tranquillity. Dax just found it to be the sort of image a business would have as a decoration in its staff break room in an attempt to prevent staff having mental breakdowns at work. Boring. <laughs> Very boring. He spent an untold amount of time in there, waiting for someone to notice that he was still alive and now awake. There wasn't the equivalent of a heavenly nurse call button, so he either had to wait for someone to come and check on him or go in search of help himself. When he finally felt like he wasn't going to immediately pass out once he stood up, Dex decided to peer around the door to his room to see if there was anyone standing in the corridor. His fear that Ulrus would be there was fortunately unfounded. Instead, a duo of friendly-looking guards were wearing the purple robes all the staff in the healing halls wore, and they smiled at him. He'd noticed Dax. They, he'd. They'd noticed Dax moving around and looked over him politely, no doubt assessing whether he was about to keel over in front of them. Dax was glad that they didn't make any moves to stop him from leaving the room, but he didn't feel like pushing his luck with another tug of war on his limbs today. All the bruises on his arm were enough for today, and it wasn't like he was going to be able to outrun them when he felt like death warmed over. Are you in pain? Can I go get you a healer if you would? I can. Ugh. Are you in pain? I can go get you a healer if you would like me to. One asked. Are you hungry? I can get you some food. Asked the other. Dax hadn't realised just how hungry he was until he w was asked if he wanted food. His stomach rumbled, angry at him for forgetting to feed it. Dax couldn't remember when he had last eaten. It must have been yesterday morning before he had visited Delgaldia, and they had talked most of the afternoon and the entirety of the night. He probably should have brought snacks with him. The pockets of his robe were certainly deep enough to carry a lot of things in them. Can I have some food, please? The words were barely out of his mouth when the guard who had asked him was already scuttling off to get it for him. They were quickly replaced by another guard who was laughing and holding a box of coloured pencils and a colouring book for you in case you get bored. There's not a lot to do here, he said with a look of someone who had spent a lot of time as a patient and a gravelly voice. Dax took the distraction gratefully and thanked the two of them before heading back into the room. The standing was starting to make him feel dizzy again. It wasn't the same guard who had gone for his food that returned with it. Instead, it was Omdum who, would, who was standing at the foot of his bed with a bowl of soup on a silver platter. 
Dax took one spoonful of the soup before immediately spitting it out into a conveniently placed decorative bowl at his bedside. Parsnip. Parsnip soup. Parsnip, the most accursed vegetable in both his home world and in this one. The smell alone made him want to gag and he pushed it away, taking the small bread buns covered in poppy seeds and all but inhaling them. He was hungry, very hungry, but not hungry enough to eat anything that had parsnip in it. Actually, after the shock of eating parsnip, Dax remembered Elgaldi had given him something to eat during their conversation, some sort of granola bar looking thing, when they had reached the part where Dethos had died. That had to mean he had been unconscious for at least a day then, if not longer, otherwise his stomach wouldn't hurt this badly. After seeing his rather violent reaction to the offensive root vegetable containing soup, Omdum had one of the guards go replace it with a simple chicken and vegetable broth that was endlessly better. Dax all but shoveled it into his face with what had to be one of the world's smallest spoons. Once he was finished eating, Omdum examined him again. Apparently he'd checked him over when he'd been brought in, but hadn't pried too deeply when Omdum had seen that he was merely exhausted. Now that Dax was awake and capable capable of advocating for his own care, Omdum wanted to do a more comprehensive medical examination. When the God of Healing reached his wrist and saw how extensive the bruising was, he frowned. How did you get this? he asked, gently rubbing his fingers over the splotches of golden copper that covered it, manipulating his hand to make sure that nothing was broken. Ulrus was very insistent that I not be sat next to the God of War, Dax answered, wincing as the swollen flesh of his wrist protested being bent back and forth. They grabbed my arm and tried to yank me away. Against your wishes? Ondam asked pointedly, looking up at his face as he wrapped a cool, feeling, supportive bandage around the bruised part of his wrist. Very much so, Dax huffed, brushing hair out of his eyes with his free, non-injured hand. The healing god seemed to be thinking very deeply as he continued winding bandages round and round until Dax was no longer able to bend his wrist at all. I've had a word, said the older god, finally pinning the end of the bandage in place with a small safety pin. Now finished with this task, he sat down in one of the chairs meant for patients' visitors that had been neatly stacked in one of the corners. He'd sort of flopped into it like he'd had a really long day and was revelling in actually being able to take a break. With all the humans praying to him for healing, his workload had to be even crazier than El Galdia. Dax awkwardly sat on the edge of the bed, fin- fiddling with the corner of the duvet cover. It was a pale orange and had little yellow and white ducks on it. The feeling of awkwardness only increased in the silence that lay between them. He wanted to ask a lot of things, the first being whether he could go yet, and the other being what the plans were to, like, actually support his health and well-being. If there were any. Did anyone, did anyone care about making things better instead of treating him like some exotic wild animal? Can I get a walking stick or a wheelchair or a walking frame? Are these scars meant to hurt this much? How do I use my powers safely? <laughs> but like every doctor's visit he had been had back in his own original world, nothing came out of his mouth. He was too scared to hear the answers or to be ignored again. So he waited in silence for the other person to say something. I'm only going to make you stay here long enough to get a proper meal down you. Don't worry about your not being ha- Don't worry you're not being held hostage in the hospital, Omdum said from his slumped position in the hospital chair. Dax sighed, the muscles in his throat were contracting almost painfully, and his eyes were embarrassingly wet wet. Don't cry, he told himself. Don't cry, don't cry in public, don't cry in public, don't cry in public. The tears that had started to well in the corners of his eyes were soon threatening to fall. So many had gathered there. He still couldn't talk, couldn't ask the things he wanted to ask, couldn't ask the things he needed to know, couldn't demand better care because he was chanting, don't cry in public, don't cry in public, don't cry in public, in his mind over and over, in an increasingly harsh tone. It proved to be pointless as a salty, wet proof of his distress defied his orders and ran down the sides of his nose. Then he hated himself even more for the loss of control. Omdum stared at him in increasing horror as he held out a handkerchief for Dax to wipe his face. 
Dax ignored it, even as it was pressed into his hand, as if not blotting his tears with it and letting them run freely down his face would mean that he wasn't crying. Having his tears acknowledged by the other god made him feel worse. I just want to go home, Dax thought, desperately, wanting to leave, but having no idea how he was actually going to get back home. And then he cried because he realised for the first time that he was thinking not of his home on Earth with his parents, his brother and his friends, but of the white marble palace of the weak god. That's Dethos' home, not your home. Everything you have is his, not yours. I'm just a placeholder. Something to fill the gap where Dethos was, just an echo of a memory. An actor playing a part, but there isn't even a script to read from. I want to go home, Dax sobbed, looking at the floating ball of light that marked the system. It beeped before flashing up a map graphic. Did it have this function since the beginning? If so, why hadn't it told him that there was an easier way of finding the war department? Home is 1.2 kilometres from this location. Would you like directions? Home was marked as Dethos' palace. Omdum offered him another handkerchief, and when he didn't acknowledge it again, he started dabbing his face for him. Dax wanted nothing more than to lie on the floor in the fetal position until this feeling went away. Until now, he hadn't really realised how lonely he'd been feeling. Sure, he saw people every day, but that didn't mean that he had any close friends here. Omdum kept wiping away his tears until they eventually dried up and Dax's face was stinging from the salt of his tears. He folded the square of fabric neatly and placed it in his pocket before gently taking Dax's hands in his own. You've been through a lot and all of this must be very frustrating for you. You're used to being very busy, you're socially isolated from the people you once knew and your manifested body isn't working the way that you were accustomed to, Omdum said. He was glowing a faint green colour that when his hands met Dax's own, felt left a comforting warmth. I don't envy you for finding out about your death the way that you did, that's for certain, but I know at least, I, but I know I at least wasn't going to keep it from you forever. Dax looked at him, ready to accuse him of lying, but the sincerity of his facial expression made him hold back. Know that I certainly haven't been as active in your care as I should have been, this isn't something that I want to use as an excuse, but there was an outbreak in the South that also needed my attention, and that led to, well, it led to the situation that we're in right now. Omdum apologised. From this closed position that they were sat in, Dax could really see the bags under his eyes, and he felt some sympathy for him. It was nice to get an apology, but that didn't mean that the one of, that one of the other healing deities couldn't have done something in his stead. With his bandaged wrist now throbbing painfully, Dax asked if something could be done about the pain, and when he, and when he'd taken the pills Omdum gladly supplied him with, he asked the question he really wanted to ask: "Can I get a mobility aid, like a wheelchair or a walking frame or a walking stick or something?" Mini Theater, Omdum, welcome to the patients we accidentally gave shoddy healthcare to support group. Let me start with our traditional greeting. Please do not sue us. There was something big happening in the mortal realm at the time. Dax, I didn't expect to see you here. Elgaldia, yeah, it took them hundreds of years to figure out how to neutralise the poison. And then they kept giving me stuff to sedate me because of the rage. Now I have an incredibly high tolerance to it. And last time I needed an arrow cut out, they couldn't put me under because the dose needed to fully sedate me. Probably would have killed me. And they thought that that was unethical. Day. They forgot me in a corridor for six days the last time a maritime disaster happened. Dax. Da, da, da. End of chapter 44. And that's where we're going to finish the reading of the book until March. <laughs> Maybe end of 44. Write that down. Write that down. Write that down. Um, I'm currently editing past streams of reading the book and it will be on the YouTube um eventually. Uh it took me five hours to edit a two hour video. <laughs> uh but other than that I will be around. 
Um, we're going to be doing an upstream, maybe. Uh, maybe just playing a game. I don't know. Uh, thank you for being here. I was going to say waffle on and off <laughs> as the stream goes down and comes back up again. <laughs> I'll see you around. Possibly on Monday. Uh, have a good time. Stay safe out there and wash those handies. I know running with scissors. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye bye, bye bye.